the early days of the conflict in the Pacific were not kind ones for Allied cruisers. Many, many of these ships were damaged, quite often severely. Many were even sunk outright. Particularly in the fierce battles off Guadalcanal, battles that led to the name Iron Bottom Sound entering the popular imagination. Quite a number of ships, Allied or Japanese, sank to those cold depths. One of the American cruisers, USS Quincy, bears the unfortunate distinction of being the first of many ships sunk in Iron Bottom Sound. Caught in a devastating crossfire, she fought until it wasn't possible to fight anymore. Her wreck, broken and shattered it may be, makes this quite clear. Her tale is one of heroism against overwhelming odds, and a ship caught in a battle she should never have faced. While her pre-war service doesn't have much to note, I will be going into detail on her final action later in the video. As is typical of these stories, however, Quincy didn't seem destined to such a bad fate. Laid down as a New Orleans-class cruiser, she was one of the final American treaty cruisers. Specifically, a heavy cruiser, she was more heavily armored than preceding designs like Pensacola or Northampton, though as we'll see, that won't necessarily help her much. The ships are easy to pick out from their predecessors visually by such things as their new turret design. These more squared-off turrets held the main battery of the ships, which, as heavy cruisers, consisted of nine 8-inch guns and three triple turrets. These were supported by eight 5-inch guns, though these were of the older 5-inch 25 caliber, not the new 5-inch 38 cropping up on American destroyers. She also carried floatplanes and the facilities to operate them. Quincy's armor, as mentioned, was relatively heavy for the period, ranging from 3 to 5 inches on her belt. Her turrets ranged from 1 to 8 inches on the turret faces, with 5 inch thick barbettes. This armor, coupled with a 1 to 2 inch deck thickness, made the ship fairly well protected for a treaty cruiser. Her turrets and barbettes in particular were designed to resist 8 inch shell fire. Finally, with 8 boilers providing 107,000 shaft horsepower, Quincy could get up to just shy of 33 knots on four screws. One of the faster cruisers around, provided she isn't compared to her eventual adversaries in Japan. In addition to this, she was one of the first American cruisers equipped with an emergency diesel generator. Now then, with her statistics out of the way, we can talk about history once more. Though, really, there is little to note here before World War II kicked off. USS Quincy was laid down on November 15th, 1933, in Quincy, Massachusetts, which is a nice little historical irony. Her launch would follow on June 19th, 1935, with her formal commissioning slightly less than a year later, on June 9th, 1936. It wouldn't take long for her to be sent off to foreign waters. Come July of 1936, Quincy was sailing in Spanish waters. This is because the Spanish Civil War was raging on, and Quincy was assigned to protect American interests in Spain. In this, she would join a multinational task force from countries as varied politically as Britain and Germany. In fact, Quincy's time there would see her encounter the German Panzerschiff. As this was well before the Second World War, though, these meetings would have been peaceful, if probably tense, affairs. For her part, Quincy evacuated nearly 500 refugees to France, in addition to her other neutrality patrol duties. She wouldn't be doing such things for long, though. By September, she was relieved by the USS Raleigh and returned to the United States. Where it is good to note, she hadn't actually finished her acceptance trials yet. That was put off for a bit in the rush to get her to Spain. While she was formally commissioned and clearly capable of sailing far from home, the formality needed to be rectified. So, upon returning to the States, Quincy entered Boston Navy Yard in October for a final pre-trial refit. This would wrap up early the next year, whereupon Quincy finished her acceptance trials over the course of March 15th to March 18th, 1937. This went off without a hitch, and the cruiser passed her trials with flying colors. Which meant she could now be sent off to the Pacific to join a good chunk of the USN already there. Specifically, she joined Cruiser Division 7, based out of Pearl Harbor. She arrived there in May, and would, thereafter, spend the next year and a half in the Pacific. This service, as one could expect of interwar American ships, consisted mostly of training exercises. These were fairly typical for the time, 
including Fleet Problem 19 off Hawaii. That one involved, among other things, defending Hawaii against attack. As we'll see, Quincy wouldn't get to put that particular practice to actual use. Because, in January 1939, she was sent back to the Atlantic Fleet. While she would also get to take part in Fleet Problem 20, her other service would prove to be fairly quiet until World War II kicked off, consisting mainly of a goodwill tour to South America and training cruises for reservists. Though, to be fair, even when the war started in Europe, her service wasn't the most exciting in the world. She spent the final months of 1939 on neutrality patrol in the North Atlantic before a scheduled overhaul. 1940 would follow in much the same way as 1939, with another visit to South America and more training cruises. It was 1941 when she had the chance to see action when she joined up with WASP's task force to enforce U.S. neutrality come April. After leaving WASP in June, she joined up with Yorktown instead and continued the same mission until July, when she sailed to Iceland, patrolling up and down that area. If it feels like I'm rushing through this, well, there isn't really much to cover. She had a pretty quiet career until Pearl Harbor. And even during that attack, Quincy was escorting a convoy from South Africa to Trinidad, arriving there on December 29th, 1941. And in the immediate aftermath, she remained in the Atlantic, returning to Iceland from January to March of 1942. Following another overhaul that lasted until May, she would get her chance to enter the action of the war. At that point, Quincy returned to the Pacific. Upon arrival in San Diego, she would be assigned to support the invasion of Guadalcanal. This would be her first taste of action, and as it would turn out, her only taste of action. It started out well enough, as she supported the marine landings on August 7th. This pre-invasion bombardment was simple enough, and not terribly dangerous, as these things go. It was the Battle of Savo Island on August 9th that would change Quincy's fate. This is a story deserving of a long video all its own, but for purposes of this one, I'll give a brief background. The Japanese, intending to disrupt the American landings, set sail down from Rabaul. Under the command of Admiral Mikawa, this force of cruisers and destroyers managed to largely avoid detection, though they were spotted a couple times, as they approached Guadalcanal. The Japanese, trained in and comfortable with night fighting, aimed to hit the Allied forces in the darkness. In this, they took advantage of issues with Allied command and the split of the Allied cruiser forces into three disparate groups. Mikawa would prove very successful in this, first hitting the southern group. Here he crippled the Australian cruiser Canberra and damaged USS Chicago. The issues with communication would see no warning reach the northern group, which was blissfully unaware of its approaching fate. Now, we can return to Quincy. At 1.50 a.m. on August 9th, searchlights sprang to life on both sides of the northern group. Three American heavy cruisers, all of them New Orleans class, were instantly illuminated by the Japanese. Caught completely by surprise, chaos reigned in the American formation, though Quincy would be prompt in her response, at least. The moment the searchlights came on, Captain Samuel Moore ordered the guns to fire on the ships with searchlights on. No hesitation, no waffling on if they were friendly or not, which did happen aboard Astoria. Unfortunately, Quincy's guns weren't ready to spring into action so quickly, so precious moments were lost bringing them into action. Moore is quoted as impatiently demanding the guns fire, but before they could, Quincy began to suffer hits of her own. First on her stern, wiping out a 1.1-inch mount, then her bridge. The worst of the early hits, though, were amidships. Her planes were set alight, and her superstructure riddled with shells. Her own searchlights were shot away in the chaos, and her 5-inch guns opened fire, which drew Japanese ire in their own rights. One mount, number 3 on her starboard side, managed to get off a handful of shots, before being blasted away by Japanese return fire. Through it all, Quincy's main guns blasted away as soon as they were able. Reports of the battle are, understandably a bit of a chaotic mess, but Quincy was able to get off at least one, possibly two, full nine-gun salvos. That would be all she managed, though, as she had to turn to avoid her burning sister ships. During that turn, her aft turret took a direct hit, jamming in place. Not that it stopped her from fighting. 
Quincy's bow turrets turned to starboard and continued to blast away. On her bridge, Captain Moore directed his ship at the eastern group of Japanese cruisers. His ship took two torpedoes on her port side, but she kept on moving anyway. Once again, her captain is quoted as saying, We are going between them, give them hell, as this was happening. And Quincy did just that. Her four turrets continued to blast away. She hit the Japanese flagship, Chokai, in her chart room, a mere 20 feet from Admiral Mikawa, who was very lucky to not be hurt, or worse, from that impact. Alas, Quincy was still caught in a crossfire with cruisers on both sides. As her sisters burned with her, she was pounded into a flaming hulk in her own right. Turret 2 went up like a bonfire, and turret 1 was put out of action as well. Her bridge would suffer a massive hit around 210, killing almost everyone in the area. Captain Moore, fatally wounded, ordered his ship beached. When her assistant gunnery officer came into the bridge, he found only three or four people still standing. Captain Moore, slumped over, straightened up one last time, but was unable to do anything but let out a groan before falling again. For all the bravery of her crew here, Quincy was doomed. The extra armor was still hardly up to a close-range pounding from multiple cruisers. The two torpedoes, furthermore, were dragging her down by the bow. The killing blow, though, as it would turn out, was a third torpedo that hit her starboard side a few minutes after the hit to her bridge. With power cut and locked into a turn, Quincy was a flaming wreck, still illuminated by searchlights, and still being pounded by Japanese guns. As her crew abandoned ship, she ultimately slipped beneath the waves after capsizing to port sometime around 2.35 to 2.40 that morning. A massive explosion ripped through her as she went down, her propellers still turning all the while. Quincy was the first ship lost in Iron Bottom Sound, but by no means the last. Her story gets lumped in with the others that night, though I, on a personal note, find a quote by another of her officers to encapsulate her stand better than any others. It is the title of the video for a reason. Everything will be okay. The ship will go down fighting. No matter what else, Quincy most assuredly went down fighting against impossible odds. What more can you ask for a warship, really? Her wreck would, eventually, be discovered by Robert Ballard of Titanic fame in 1992. She rests upright on the ocean floor, her bow torn away, and missing just ahead of her foremost turret. Her aft turret is centered, pointing to her stern, at the base of a collapsed hull. The rest of her stern, past those guns, is tilted up to the sky from that collapse. And her bow turrets? They're pointing to starboard still. Her super-firing turret has a burst gun, while the lower bow turret has a jammed gun. Quincy kept fighting until her weapons failed her in the end. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.